So, uh, before I start, uh, can I have a show of hands? How many of you have... Yes! <laughs> Very good, it's done. Okay, that's it. I'm finished. Uh, how many of you have built uh, mobile web apps? Cross-platform mobile web apps. Okay, cool. So, this is kind of for you guys. Um, and I feel your pain. I've had that pain as well. Um, so, when you're building these apps, uh, the big problem, the, the big issue that you face is getting them to work cross-platform. But actually, if you are working with clients, uh, it's not just mobile. Often you have to build a website as well. There might be an API. Uh, if you're doing something really interesting, there might be a TV interface, a tablet interface. There might be hybrid versions. You might have to do native versions as well. So it's actually a bigger problem than just cross-platform. It's multi-platform. And you can see that in, uh, I think, Owen Barnes, when he was talking this morning about SocketStream, uh, said there's different places in SocketStream where you can put different views. So you can have different versions of your service uh, for tablets, for uh, mobile, for web, whatever. Uh, but there's an inherent problem in that because now you have to create all these different versions. Uh, and that's a problem that we've had and that we've tried to solve. The other aspect to this, and this is something that has arisen in our work uh, as a consulting company, is a lot of companies are coming to us now and saying, we don't just want one app. We want a suite of apps. So we work with a travel guide company that builds the same app for a bunch of different cities. It's a city guide. But you can imagine how many cities there are in the world. That's their market. They want to build the same app again and again and again. Different styling, slightly different features. How are they going to do it? And they were doing it using cut and paste. Um, so we've, we've kind of come up with uh, a tool, a development tool, to help solve these problems. Um, so I just want you to think for a moment about the current state uh, of cross-platform HTML5 mobile web app development, which I think is represented fairly well by this picture. OK? It's really, really messy. OK, you can do it. Um, you can take a responsive approach, and you can get pretty far with that. But the responsive stuff doesn't help you when you're trying to build hybrid or native as well. You're kind of stuck. Uh, and I think we're kind of stuck in a world where we want to be able to build one app okay, on one assembly line, any color so long as it's black. We do it once, everybody's standards compliant, and we're done. Unfortunately, that world doesn't really exist, and we have to move on. And I think the place we have to move to is this world. So today, if you go and buy a BMW, it's built to order. It's not one car coming out of one assembly line. And the key thing about assembly lines, the real genius of them, is not that you're building the same thing again and again. It's that it's easy to build variants. So when you go and you select the color and the stereo system and all the extra features and all the stuff that you want, that goes into the BMW system. And that car is produced for you. And that's what we need to do for apps, to access all of these different devices and platforms and things that are coming down the road. So we're solving two key problems with this uh, tool that we've developed. One is this multi-platform problem. So these are, these are two examples from clients that we've had. Uh, one was a newspaper, and they came to us and they said, we don't just want mobile apps, we want everything. And we want native, and we want hybrid, and all that sort of stuff. So you can see that it's not just about building mobile web apps. You've got to solve a bigger problem. The travel guys I spoke about already, they want to build apps. They have to work on just Android and iOS, but they have to build hundreds of things. So we have to solve this problem. And instead of just hacking at it uh, and just creating a build tool, I kind of went back to uh, some fundamentals. And it's important when you build these things to have a good foundation for what you're doing. Uh, so I have been messing around uh, with something called generative programming for about 10 years. Um, and it's kind, of a, it's kind of an approach to creating source code uh, using automated processes. And it actually comes from a couple of guys working in the auto industry uh, where a lot of this stuff arose. So 
Uh, Czarnecki and Eisenecker kind of developed the foundations for this. Uh, and one of the things that was really important to me was not just to build, not just to create another build tool, um, not to end up where Ant went in the Java world, which just started off as a quick hack and became a sort of unmanageable mess after a while. And then people introduced Maven, that sort of stuff, or make files. I wanted it to have a solid uh, theoretical basis. So think of the relational data model for SQL databases, or think of the Lambda calculus for functional languages. Something solid to base the tool on. Um, and the idea is really that you decompose what you're trying to build into a set of features. And then you imagine a set of forks. You descend this tree of variations. And each path in the tree, each endpoint, is one of the apps that you end up with. And this gives you a solid theoretical basis to work from. So essentially what you do when you generate apps using this approach is you take some resources. These are your HTML files, or your Objective-C files, or your images, or whatever. You apply some transformations to them. And you produce a version of your app for each target. And you have to be able to control how that happens. So in order to do that, you have to have a number of, of ideas in your head. One is this idea that you have resources that you want to change. Transforms are things that you do to the resources. You have a set of settings and configurations that control what happens. And then you have this idea of forking the different versions. So there's nothing, uh, there's not there rocket science here as such. But instead of doing all this manually, uh, the tool that we've developed allows you to get this under control and do it very easily. Um, so here's an example. This is a really, really simple app. And I want to produce four versions of it, one for iOS, one for Android. And it's got two skins, one and two. So I end up with four different versions. The resources that I have, uh, I have a separate styling for Android. I have separate styling for iOS. I want to be able, in my index.html, to say, just pull in style.css. I don't care which version it is. I want to keep my HTML simple. Uh, I have a different set of images for skin one and a different set for skin two. Again, when I'm coding, I don't really care which it is. I just want to get that under control. I run it through the app. It produces a number of different forks, and I come out with four versions. And it's very easy for me to keep this under control. My code base is smaller than if I'm using if statements and CSS hacks and all sorts of weird stuff to get this under control. So the transformations that I apply to do this are essentially a set of simple steps, copying the files from one place to the other. And these are things that you'd see in other build tools. They're pr pretty simple copying files, running compilers, all that sort of stuff. But we place it in the context of these different versions and this forking ability. On top of that, we layer a set of settings. So all of the different variants are going to have different settings, different titles, different features might be turned on and off. All of that stuff is context that you use to build the app. One set of the context is completely freeform. You can add in your own settings, whatever you like. Another is specific to each step. So when you're working on a particular file, you want to be able to access the contents of that file, its path, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the build steps are very, very simple steps that do things like uh, do a search and replace on the contents, or load a file into memory, or save it out again. And we keep the build steps extremely simple. And in fact, the uh, commands that you use to actually build the thing are essentially macros composed from very, very simple steps. So the system itself is easy to extend. Finally, the forking uh, is where the real power comes in. And the key thing here is that the way that we keep complexity under control is that when you think about the process, you think about it as a linear process. You don't really worry about forks when you're defining what happens. You specify the points at which they occur. But when you lay out the build process, it's completely linear. And again, this is about managing the complexity uh, so that you don't have to worry about it, and so that it's all encoded declaratively in one place. Um, as a result, and the goal here is avoiding code that's littered with all, sort of, all sorts of hacks and if statements and things like that. 
Uh, if you're building a hybrid version of a mobile web app and you're using PhoneGap, you have to worry about how you're going to include PhoneGap.js and what you're going to do. Um, one of the hacks we used uh, a while back was simply serving an empty PhoneGap.js from the web server so that it didn't interfere with the main code base. And the, the reason for that is you want to keep the code base the same for as many apps as possible. So the tool that we're launching to do this is rather imaginatively named uh, AppGen. Um, it's a Node.js module, of course. Um, and it's our kind of open source implementation of this model and this approach. Um, really easy to install. It gives you a command line tool to run. Uh, and you just provide a JSON specification file that runs through uh, all the different steps and generates the files for you. Uh, you can also use it dynamically. So one of the use cases here is to have a non-technical user press a button and get an app generated for them. Uh, and that has arisen out of our own work, um, but we think it's really powerful. The specification itself is pretty straightforward. right? So you can, you can specify it as JSON or CoffeeScript uh, or even a Node.js module, which is probably the easiest. Uh, you specify the folder that contains your resources and the folder that you're going to output the different versions to. You specify some configuration, and here I'm using the title of the app. But this could be uh, the contents of the app. It could be layout configuration. So on iOS, you might want to have a tab bar. On Android, you might want to move that to the top, change the styling, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then the steps to create it. And these are, the, these are the steps that you've seen already in the example. The first step just runs index.html as a template. Um, it's an EJS template, actually. Um, that will embed the title for you. Uh, then we fork, because we want to have an iOS version and an Android version. And the next thing we do is we pull in the correct CSS. And you can see that I'm referencing the name of the fork. It's either iOS or Android to get the right file. But you can see it's maintaining a linear order. It's the same thing for every fork. You don't have to worry about what happens for different versions. Finally, I'm going to fork again, because I want different skins. And again, it's still linear. And then I pull in the images that I need. And that's pretty much it. The whole idea here, remember, is to maintain control over the code, to give you an organized structure for building loads and loads of different versions. So yes, you could go out and set up your own build process. You could set up the structure yourself. But we've given you a model and a way to control it really, really easily. You can call out to whatever other build tools you want to use. That's also really easy. But we've given you a conceptual, a conceptual model to get this under control. Uh, so here's an example of a use case. Uh, speechwriters.com is one of our clients. Uh, and they've been around for about 10 years. And they sell speeches. So you can buy best man speeches, or birthday speeches, or graduation speeches. They have about 10,000 speeches in loads and loads of different categories. Um, they were doing very, very well on the internet for a long time. Uh, and it's a great business, by the way, because think about it. You're the best man. You haven't written a speech. The wedding is tomorrow. What do you do? You just buy the speech for $20. Right? It's a great business. The problem is apps have come along, and apps have reduced their income, and they need to have apps. Uh, but you can't have an entire catalog of speeches in an app. That goes against the basic principles of app UX design. There's too much in it. Apps are meant to be simple. So they wanted to split up the apps into different categories. Each app, of course, is pretty much the same. Uh, it's one or two levels deep. Find the speech you want, buy it, and you're done. But you need to do that 20 times for 20 different apps. And you need to do it on iOS and Android and probably Windows Phone and different stuff down the road. So this problem is something that the tool that we've created uh, is really, really good at solving. Uh, I'm showing a uh, user interface here, which is a small kind of CMS that we built for them to control the categorization of the speeches. And they just create a new category for every app that they want, put in the speeches and subcategories of speeches that they like, and they press a Build It button. And that goes off and generates the app for them. And they download the IPA file and the APK file and they're done. And they can do it as many times as they like. And they can choose different skins, all that sort of stuff. So this is a, a kind of a, a perfect use case for 
uh, this particular tool. It's not only about cross-platform. It's not only about solving the iOS-Android divide. It's also about pulling in different content, different types of functionality, different things that you need to do, but keeping it all in the one code base. So the tool itself at the moment uh, is newly open sourced. Uh, we've been using it in production for about six months. Um, it's got to the point where we're relatively confident that it'll basically work. Um, the main features that we wanted to put in it are there. Um, and learning from my experiences with other build tools, I really wanted it to be easy to create new uh, steps and new instructions. Uh, and I didn't want you to have to jump out into a different language too often to do that. So it has a macro system in there so that it's really, really easy to build complex steps from simple ones. Uh, and the macros are relatively hygienic and all that sort of stuff. Um, so they're quite easy to use. Of course, if you have a complex build step, you can always drop out into JavaScript to do it for you. Um, the build process, um, well, I'm going to claim that it's Turing complete. I, I don't know. But we have loops and we have conditionals if you need them. Um, so you're not kind of stuck. Uh, that linearity is important to maintain. But obviously, the abstraction is going to leak sometimes, so you need to drop out. Um, there's an API to access resources. So if you want to pull the stuff from GitHub, you can do that as well, as opposed to just working with the file system. Uh, and then running sub-processes is an important part of this, because you need to be able to run uh, the Xcode tools or whatever. Uh, the final thing about the tool is that it's relatively language agnostic. So it was built and motivated by the need to write HTML5 web apps. But it can actually build any sort of app. And we use it to build native apps as well. Uh, particularly, it is useful for hybrid apps, where you have let's say, an in-app purchase plugin. So that's, uh, that would be the example of the speechwriters guys. Uh, it's a hybrid app. On iOS, you have one plugin. And on Android, you have a different plugin. Most of the app is the same, but you need to pull in a different plugin for the different versions. Uh, and finally, the entire thing is asynchronous, so you can use whatever other node modules you want. So finally, if you're thinking about using this, there's a relatively good set of criteria for deciding whether you need to or not. Um, do, you need to need, do you need to build lots of apps that are kind of similar? Maybe you need to reskin them, that sort of thing. Do you need to support multiple configurations? And by that, I mean, do you need to select different features for different use cases? Um, do you need to build cross-platform HTML5 apps? It's really good at that as well. Um, do you have users that need to be able to specify predefined criteria for apps and press a button and get an app? Um, and do you need, and this is most important for me as a coder, do you need a way to organize your code so that you can handle multiple different versions? And if a client comes to you or for your startup, you want to build a service that has a website and has mobile web versions and has hybrid versions and has tablet versions and goes to TV and all these different things, this provides an easy way to organize your code and get your work done. Thank you very much.